Today, we're talking about getting started in programming projects and things that you can do at the very beginning to make your experience in your project so much better. Welcome back, friends. Today's video is inspired by a conversation I recently had with my kids, but it's one that I've had with a lot of different students over the years, and so I thought it would be a good one for today's video. They, like a lot of you, may just be learning to program, you're getting started on different projects, and some of the things you do at the beginning maybe aren't helping you. So today I wanted to give a couple pointers to help you rethink how you start projects so that you can get them done more quickly and have more fun along the way. Now, obviously, there are a lot of different things that I could recommend. There's a lot of different parts to working through a project. I'm focusing on the beginning because that's really what sets the tone. With the things you do at the beginning, you live with for the rest of the project. Let's just say your computer science professor just assigned you a new project. Maybe it's a new project at work. Maybe it's a new hobby project. Doesn't matter. When a new programmer starts a new project, they almost always dive straight into the code. Brand new programmers want to pop up their editor. They create a new .c or .cpp file and they start writing code because that feels like the thing that's gonna get us closer to complete. We wanna make some source files, we create a main function, and we start writing up code for the first part of the project that jumps into our head. Now that may seem reasonable, but for you new programmers out there, this is a recipe for headaches down the road, and there are some things that you can do to make your life easier at the very beginning. Specifically, I'm talking about setting up your project. Now, let's look at what I mean. Okay, so say I've been assigned to write my own memory allocator. My own implementation of malloc and free, it's actually not that hard. Maybe sometime we'll get into that in another video. But let's see what happens if I just jump into the code, right? If I just jump into the code, I might end up with something like this. If I created a malloc, I created a free, so I'm starting to write some code. Let's say that I want to implement this as a library of some sort. I have other videos on making libraries, so links in the description if this is new. But I created my .c file and I made a malloc and a free function, and I might even start putting some code in these functions if I have an idea of how I'm gonna implement them. We're gonna skip that part today because that's not really the point of this video. But say I have these functions ready to go, I start working on them. How do I know if they work? Well, I need some code to test them. They don't really do much by themselves. So I need some code that's gonna test them out. So I'll make a main, something like this. And then I could make a pointer P and call malloc, um, something like this. And then I can just see if I can assign 45 into that space. Okay, this might be an initial first test to see if my malloc implementation works. And then we're gonna compile things. So let's just say we're gonna compile our library something like this. And sometimes your professor tells you how to compile this. Uh, we're gonna first say allocator.o and we're just gonna, okay, we'll compile allocator.c. Okay, so that, that compiles our allocator into a .o file. If we wanted to make a shared library, we could do something like this, uh, pic shared allocator.c, and then let's just call it allocator.so. So we could do that as well. And that's going to help create my shared object file. Okay, that's, that's fine. For now, we'll stick to the .o file because that'll keep things a little bit simpler. But say then I need to compile my test program. So something like this. And then I can just run my memtest program and I can see that things seem to work, which actually doesn't make any sense since I don't have any allocator, except it actually does make sense because when I compile this, I forgot to add my allocator.o to it. And so now it's seg faults. Okay, we have a problem with our allocator. Cool. Now this may seem fine at first, maybe, and it's definitely what I see a lot of students do. They just start typing in compile commands. They're trying to test out this code that they've written, but let's look at what happens if instead we set up our project first. Now, Mark Twain famously said, if it's your job to eat a frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Now his point is get the worst stuff done first. And some of the things that I'm about to recommend are things that students often look at like eating a live frog. When I ask about it in office hours, they're like, ah, do I have to? Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. I just thought I'd do it later or maybe not at all, right? But the things that I'm gonna recommend are here for a reason, so let's do them first. Specifically, there are two things that I would like you to do at the beginning of every project. 
The first is create a Git repository or Mercurial or SVN or whatever version control system you want to use, create a repository, put your code in it and use that repository. As you make changes to your project, commit those changes into the repository. This will save you tons of time down the road when you accidentally have some kind of bug that blows away your code. I saw this with my daughter just the other day. She had a project, we were talking about it and her bug caused her to blow away a bunch of source code. Fortunately, everything was in Git and she was able to recover it. And I know some of you are saying it's a simple project. This might seem overkill. It's not. Just do it. It only takes a second and it could save you a lot of time down the road and it's giving you experience with version control, which is something as a professional developer that you need anyway. So the second thing that you should do at the beginning of every project is set up a build system. So students are always coming to me for help on their projects. And often they're about halfway done and they're having some kind of problem and they show me their code and I say, oh, can I see your make file? I, you forgot to include it. And they go, oh, I haven't written it yet. And I'm like, what? And it's like they think that the make file is there for me. It's not, it's there for you. It's there to help you. I require make files in my projects to help my students because I'm trying to make their job easier. So for this example, I'm going to use a make file, but this works for make, rake, ant, maven. Use a simple shell script for all I care. I don't care. The point is you need to set up your build and it's going to make a huge difference in your productivity. So for this simple example, I just have a make file here. That's what I'm going to use. Often you just copy one from a prior project and tweak a few things. It only takes a second, take a little bit longer today because I'm making it from scratch and explaining as I go. But normally this process is really fast. So let's just make a few variables at the beginning. I like to usually have one that has my, that specifies my compiler. That way I can change it really quick. I can then specify a few common flags because who has time to type all those in? And let's make a variable that has our .o files and let's make a bin variable that has the binary that we're going to compile. Okay, then we're gonna have an all rule that's going to compile our binary. Let's make a rule for compiling our binary from our obj's and we'll just add our compiler and our c flags and our obj's and we will output the name being main, okay? If you haven't seen make before, I do have some videos on make and you can take a look at those. They may be helpful. Let's make one more rule here. Uh, this will just compile our .o files. Let's see. And we'll do pretty much the same thing in here, but we're gonna use dash c. And then we're gonna use some automatic variables. This just makes life a little bit simpler. But like I was saying, I have videos on this. If you want to check them out, it may, if you haven't seen this, if you need a refresher, these can help you out. I'll link to them in the description. Let's also throw in a clean target really quick. That will just allow us to clean stuff up if we need to like blow away all the intermediate compile cruft. I have the dash R because I'm on a Mac and these debug symbols are directories. So that's kind of a pain, but it's okay. All right, so that'll delete our debug symbols and our .o files, so that should be fine. Okay, so now I can just run make to compile my program, that works great. And I can run make clean if I want to get rid of stuff. Let me just remove that .so file. We'd get to that later if we wanted to use a .so file, I'm just not going to right now. But the point is, is that I can use make and make clean now really quickly. Now the question is, was it worth it going to this effort? Was it worth creating this file, which took some extra time? It wasn't, it's not free, nothing's free. And it's tempting sometimes to think, ah, this is really just a simple program. I don't need a make file for this one. And I haven't really bothered learning make yet. So maybe I'll do that on the next project. But folks, the answer to this is almost always yes. It is worth it to have some kind of build system. So let's talk about why. First of all, typing make is faster than typing clang-g allocator.c memtest.c-o main, right? That's way faster. If I type at a constant rate, it will be roughly 10 times faster to type make, but in reality, it's even more because typing make takes almost no thought. I don't have to think about it, I just type make. But typing out these long commands, well, on the other hand, that takes thought. I have to think about it. And of course, as things get more complicated, say I wanna create a shared object file and I add more compiler flags and yeah, things are gonna get much, much worse. But 
even if you don't get super complicated, you are spending mental energy on typing in these commands. So it's not just time, it's consuming your mental energy, which you wanna be spending on your program and getting your code right. Yes, I know you can use terminal history to go back up and find your old commands. That makes things slightly less painful, but relying on terminal history is fragile. If I reboot my machine, if I accidentally close my terminal window, tomorrow when I come back to this project in a new terminal session, I'm going to have to remember this command. How did I build it? I might type it incorrectly. I might forget my dash G and not realize it until I get into my debugger and realize that I can't do what I wanted to do. And the point is you're going to spend a lot of time in little chunks, of course, but they add up. You're gonna be spending a lot of time and mental energy that you could be spending on getting the project done. And folks, that's why we have build systems. They give us consistency. They free up our minds to work on other things. They make future repetitive error-prone tasks easy and error-free. Also, while we're at it, don't limit yourself when it comes to your build system. Anything that you do that's repetitive can almost always be automated. So it's like, say your class uses an auto grader and you have to submit your file as a zip archive. We could just type in zip and the zip file, whatever. We could, we could do that, yes. But we could also add that like this to our build file. So something like this. And then we could come down here and make another target that is submit. And, and let's just say we want to make sure we blow away the old one. And then I'm just going to zip up the new one. And of course this would work for tar and gzip and any other zip format you want. Doesn't really matter. And let's just say I want my bin to be in there. But if we had multiple bins, whatever, or let's say that I want to include my source files, whatever. The point is, is I can create it right here. And now down here, I can just say make, make submit. And you see, I get a project 5.zip file. And now every time I wanna submit my code, I can just run make submit. And as long as I get it right once here in the make file, I don't have to worry about it next time. It's gonna be right every time. I'm never gonna mistype it. And I can't tell you how many times students have lost points because they named some file wrong. And so their auto grader didn't recognize what they submitted. So friends, if you haven't been doing this, it's time to start. Don't put off your build system and don't develop code outside of version control. At the beginning of every project, eat the frog. Set up Git, set up your build system. Don't overthink it, but do take these simple steps at the beginning of your project to set yourself up for an easier time in the future. And of course, I hope this helps. Let me know how it goes. Like this video if it was helpful, especially if it changed your life. Become a subscriber and turn on notifications if you wanna make sure you don't miss the next one. Here are a few more videos you might like, and until the next one, happy coding, my friends. I'll see you later.